One of the problems in our trade in the HVAC industry is not just that guys and gals, folks in our industry, professionals, technicians are doing things incorrectly, but sometimes the biggest problem is we may not even know we're doing things incorrectly. And I'm guilty of this in my career. You kind of do things the way you were taught, not knowing that there are better ways to do things. And in today's video, we're going to set the record straight. We're going to size a supply duct the correct way. I got time with JC Canfield. Thank you to JC once again for taking time out to show us how to do things correctly. Let's get to it. I see this done incorrectly all the time. And you know, if I'm honest, I probably don't even have the correct way of doing it. We're going to install a heating and air system. How do we size a supply duct? Let's talk about first how you don't do it. Okay, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> so if you're using that chart that says it's this size and this many CFM for a flex duct or any other kind of duct because there's charts for metal duct that look just like that. There's charts for flex duct. There's charts for square duct that look like that. If you're using those charts to design your ducts, please throw them away. That's not the way that you should do it. It's never been okay. I don't know who made those and decided that that was a good idea to put out into the world, but... If you want to design ducts with that, you're going to keep going back to fix airflow issues and it's going to cost you money. The number one way is to determine the CFM you need with a load calculation of every room. And then you also have to choose which is the worst condition of the room, heating or cooling. And then that's the CFM that you use. So inherently, you may have oversized ductwork for heating in the heating season in some places and undersized ducts for cooling depending on which one you choose. So often there will need to be adjustments because it's not feasible to design a duct system that does both for each and every room because you're not going to put two vents in the bathroom, you're not going to put two vents in every bedroom, that's just not going to happen. There's just not enough money in a heating and air conditioning job to do a, a heating duct and a cooling duct. So I understand what you're saying. You're saying, say in Florida, if the duct work is sized correctly for the cooling season, it will now be oversized when it comes time to turn the heat on, even though they rarely do that. But now we've got duct work that's way too big or vice versa. If we're up in Minnesota, if it's sized for heating, it'd be undersized for cooling because you have different airflows for heating and cooling in different areas. Got it. Some areas are one to one, but not many. Got it. Builders aren't going to pay for two duct systems, a heating duct system and a cooling duct system. Right. And no homeowner is going to pay for that either. But always try in the master bedroom, in the bedrooms, if the contractor or the homeowner will let me do it, I put two ducts in. Say, hey, you need to close this one in the winter and you need to close this one in the summer. Or you need to leave both of them open in the summer and close one of them in the winter. But if you're using that chart, that's not the way you do it. And so it's just like designing a return dock, except we use a little bit different numbers. TSS times 100 divided by the total effective length. So it's just like designing returns. With returns, we use 0 0.05. And with supplies, we use 0.1. So it'd be 0.1 okay. times 100 divided by the total effective length. So you add up all, all of your fittings, your elbows, your boots, any kind of Ys or anything like that. You add that into your duct calculation, and that determines the size of your trunk. And then you do that for each branch. If you use a program like... Brightsoft, which is absolutely the best one, and I would like to mention that they're not sponsoring us either, but if you use, learn to use Brightsoft and do load calculations, it will design the duct system for you, and all you have to do is give it the parameters that it needs and put in the right heat transfer multipliers and select the equipment correctly with all the right restrictions, and you should most of the time end up with 0.1 at the end and 0 0.05 on the return. Using this formula, you're going to do everything individually, right? So if we've got eight branch lines, you want to do each branch line individually because the second branch line doesn't necessarily care that you're going to be putting a 90 on the fourth branch line. 
that has nothing to do with the total effective length of the second branch line, correct? Would so if it's so if you're doing a trunk and branch duct system, that's where you have one trunk and you have individual branches. It does not matter to the trunk unless you're sizing that one at the very end. So if you so you're not going to do, you know, a trunk and then a branch and then why it off to somewhere else. You're going to run a single duck off of each one. When you start adding Ys onto a trunk and branch duck system, that's when things get a little weird because then that changes your trunk line size all the way back to the furnace. Got it. So okay. especially if you didn't account for it. But if you're doing just a what they call a spider duck system, what you call a spider duck system and what I call a trunk with Ys is a little bit different. So here we we use a central furnace and uh, we use a uh, trunk and Y. So you'll you'll have a furnace that stands up in the attic and then we have a giant supply plenum and then we run ducts off of that and sometimes we'll run so far and then Y off to two other ducts. But you never want to do more than two Ys. You don't want to go 50 feet to the back of the house hit a Y for the master bedroom and then come off of one of those branches to another Y that hits the bathroom in the closet. You know what I mean? Yeah. I do want to, cause I'm, I'm just picturing if someone sees this video and they're sitting down and they've now got their formula in front of them and they're about to, and we're going to size a duct in just a second. We're going to use a real life example here, but I want to understand two concepts. So the first one is when I'm sizing my trunk, does the trunk care about the total effective length of the branches at all? Yes, it does. It, it does. does. And and is it the longest one? Is it the furthest away one? Which one does it care? Or is it all of them? It's all of them. So your trunk, say, say you're going to run a duck underneath a house for a supply. Say it's a, so it's a pier and beam house and you've got one central furnace and then all of, and it's out in the garage and the whole house is a ranch house and it's in it's all this one direction. So you're going to start out um, a large duck that goes down and then you're going to drop off in size as you get towards the end. And each one of those transitions in size will help you maintain velocity through that duck. That way you have the, enough velocity to get the amount of air you need to each room. So that last duck is going to determine the size of the end of the trunk line. And then the middle duck is going to determine the size of, of the transition that goes down to the next duck and so on and so on. But you're going to start out with a very large duck and then reduce as you go. So you maintain velocity. The formula, if I'm going to sit down and size my trunk, you're saying I add up all of my branch lines and that's going to determine what the total effective length will ultimately be with each section of the trunk line? In a sense, yes. So you're, so you know, you've got 1200 CFM to work with. You're going to go 10 feet mm -hmm. and you know, and then when you start branching off from there, you're going to subtract the CFM for each room. And then that's that's going to help you determine the next size and the size of the next transition. OK, got it. All right. So I'm, I'm with you now. All right. And then now let's say we're going to say size the second takeoff. So we're going to come off. We already came off once and went to one room. Now we're going to come off, go to another room. So now I need to know how to size that second branch line. So after your first branch in in some cases, it may still be the same size. You may not need to reduce your trunk size until you've you've taken three three drops off of it. You're talking about the trunk. You will not have the trunk. Yeah, you did not need to reduce down yet on your trunk. Got it. Okay. I'm I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of somebody that's watching this video. Now you've told them how to they they know how to size their their trunk. Now we're gonna size each supply. So I just picked one. I picked a random one. I said the second one, right? So now we're going to size that one because the second one doesn't care what the si the total effective length of the fourth one is or the sixth one. We're going to size right. just the second one now. And so the second one, so what is the total effective length 
of our start starting collar on metal duck systems this start collar right here mm -hmm. is worth 35 feet so 35 feet and let's say we're going to go 15 feet of just con just straight pipe so that's 35 plus 15 and then we're going to 90 up 15 and then what's the total effective length of a 90 on this one on this duculator for this kind of duct is 10 feet so another 10 feet and then our boot and then depending on which boot you want to use so if it we're just going to say this is under a house so we'll use one like this one that's worth 30 feet 30 feet okay so 35 plus 15 plus 10 what is that 50 60 so it's equal to 90 90 feet 90 equivalent feet so in this case you're going to go 0.1 times 100 which always equals 10 divided by 90 and how many cfm did we want out of this duck 100 we want 100 cfm so you're going to move your duculator over to the friction loss and you're going to move it over to your point 0.1 to 100 and that puts your duck right there just under a six in this case i would still use a six so point 0.1 times 100 is 10 divided by 90. So 10 divided by 90 is point 0.1111. So then on our duculator, we would find point 0.1. Move it to 100 CFM on your friction loss and air quantity CFM just under a 6. So in this case, I would use a 6-inch run. Bam. That's how you do it. And that's how you do it. It's important to note that each brand of Flex has their own duculator now for metal pipe you'll always be able to find a duculator that's for metal pipe but almost all of them are based on 100 feet but different brands of different flex do different cfms so like you know atco makes the best flex and they you they they have the best cfm out of their flex like some of the other brands that are out there uh, don't do the same amount of cfm through their flex so you have to pay attention to what you're doing, especially the cheaper way to do the duck is to use uh, a brand of say quiet flex, but quiet flex is, you know, 10% less efficient in moving air. So you'll have to redesign the duck system. So if you're doing a cookie cutter house and they want you to, they, they've had the same design for the duck system and you use quiet flex, you may lose 10% of your air, which may not be a big deal, but you know, it just depends if somebody goes through there at the end of the job with a bolometer and they check the CFM and they're going to be like, hey, we're not getting the right amount of CFM. I don't know. We designed it. We did it exactly the way your duck plan says, you know, mm -hmm. that's the uh -huh. answer. Yeah, I think this is uh, all good stuff. Any final thoughts on this one? When you're out there designing duck, um, make sure that you're paying attention to what you're doing. I know a lot of guys get sent to a job. And like, hey, here's the load calculation. Here's all the CFMs you need and uh, design the duct system for that. This is how you do it. If you do it the way I'm telling you, it'll keep you out of trouble and the house will be comfortable. JC, if I've got a house that I know it's going to have 1,200 CFMs, how do you determine how many CFMs need to be dispersed to each room? You need to, to do a load calculation because it's... Um, the low calculation will tell you the CFM and the amount of cooling and heating that you need for each room. And that same house is probably built all over town, but it's in different directions. And the directions of the way the sun and the wind hits that house changes the amount of BTUs in, and CFM in each room. So that's how you do it. We've done other videos on sizing a return duct, sizing the filter grill and filter correctly. And now of course, in this video, sizing the supply duct. I'll put a link down in the description of this video on some different ductulators. We're gonna do more videos like this, getting things out, making sure folks know how to do things correctly. Let me know your thoughts down in the comments section. If you like this video, I think you'll like this one even more. It's where we met with JC and he showed us how to size a filter grill. Thanks for watching. Hit that subscribe button. We'll see you next time.